When astronauts see Earth from space, they experience a cognitive shift in awareness that our planet is one single ecosystem. It's called the overview effect. And down here, it's easy to lose sight of it. When you zoom in, the habitats that make up our planet often feel totally independent from one another. And time moves so slowly, we cannot see what is changing right in front of us. To succeed as a species, we must learn to live in balance. And while we haven't figured out how to do that yet, we can learn from those that have. Ray Hilborn and Daniel Schindler are professors at the University of Washington. They spend each summer on the glacial lakes of southwestern Alaska to study an iconic fish, the sockeye salmon. To the casual observer, these may appear to be just another species of fish, but for this ecosystem, they are much, much more. There's an ecological term called a keystone species, which means it really determines the structure and function of the ecosystem. And sockeye is that in this ecosystem. Sockeye bring an enormous amount of nutrients from the ocean. Most of the energy that supports the resident fish, the trout, the char, the bear population would be much, much smaller without the, without the sockeye salmon. So they really drive the dynamics of, of, of this ecosystem. In 1946, the uh, Bristol Bay salmon processors were pretty unhappy with the way the federal government was managing the fishery. I mean, it was being managed by somebody in Washington, D.C., who would send a telegram every day saying what to do. And the processing companies really felt that this just wasn't working. There wasn't really much any science going on. So they contacted the dean of the School of Fisheries at UW to come up and give them some advice on what they could do. And they came up with a team, mostly World War II veterans, and took a look around and said, OK, here's the following things we could do. And they set up a series of field camps, including one here, and started investigating the, the whole ecosystem. The founders were extremely far-sighted and really designed a, a monitoring system for the whole ecosystem that really remains intact to this day. So there's a, a number of standard measurements we do. Limnology, the zooplankton, the phytoplankton, the lakes, the temperature, sampling juvenile fish, walking streams, inventorying streams, counting fish in streams. We call those sort of the core uh, program activities, and we, we continue those to this day. Sockeye salmon are anadromous, meaning they are born in fresh water, but spend most of their adult lives in the salty ocean before returning home to spawn. On this final journey of their life, they swim hundreds of kilometers through rivers and lakes to the precise location where they were born. How they are able to navigate with such accuracy is something of a mystery. But each year, like clockwork, tens of millions of sockeye arrive, bringing life and energy to the inland waters of Alaska and ushering the creation of the next generation. Following them closely is a community of scientists, undergraduates to postdocs to professors. They've been coming here every year since 1946, collecting data and keeping close watch over the salmon and their ecosystem. And while the days are long and the work is exhausting, it is clear from their passion and commitment that there's no place else they'd rather be.
Each year, scientists collect various types of data from juvenile and adult sockeye. They employ a variety of methods, including beach seeding for adult spawners at the mouth of their home stream. It's a laborious process, safely capturing and carefully examining individual fish, but the effort is well worth it. In this type of sampling, each sockeye is mildly sedated, measured, checked for sexual maturity, and tagged. This is a female. 482. 152. The tags are used to keep track of where individuals go once they reach their native stream. A sample of each fish's tissue is collected for analysis, which allows scientists to determine genetic differences between subpopulations. At max efficiency, they can process about one fish a minute before they are returned to the lake, resuscitated and released. And over the course of the summer, they'll examine nearly 1,500 individuals. Adding up all the work done each year in the Alaska Salmon Program illustrates the scope of the effort. Samples from around 250,000 sockeye are collected each year, around 12 million since the program began. And that's just sockeye. If you count all the species of fish examined, the number balloons to 30 million individual fish. In science, the more data the better, which is why even dead fish are valued here. Tragically, sockeye die after they spawn. But when they do, scientists collect their bodies and remove their ear bones called otoliths to determine their specific age down to the day. They can do this because otoliths are like tree rings, with each ring precisely marking the passage of time. They have been collecting them here since the beginning of the program and maintain one of the largest collections of otoliths in the world. All of this data from field work that spans three generations paints a broad picture of how the ecosystem changes over time. It informs the specific, like quantifying how many sockeye spawn each year, to the broad, such as how a large and complex ecosystem behaves as the sum of smaller independent parts. And when you step back and think about what the science is telling us, you might realize there are lessons here that go way beyond just fish. So there are several general principles I think we can derive from our research. One of them is that naturally functioning ecosystems can continue to function even though there's a heavy human presence in them. We don't have to lock up ecosystems and people and keep people out of them for them to continue functioning. Fishery management is a complicated process and it involves making decisions that often lead to errors. You know, habitat buys us a lot of options for managing these systems. And when you have watersheds that have the habitat intact, they become forgiving of management errors. As a result, these fisheries continue to thrive. And management that operates in a trial and error, scientifically based adaptive framework can roll with the punches and uh, continue to support vibrant economies. On the final stage of their journey, Sockeye make one last push to reach the specific location where they were born. And for those swimming up shallow streams, it is both exhausting and risky. Bears have learned that the streams form a choke point, making it easier to catch a nutritious meal, while seagulls use the shallow waters to ambush Sockeye and eat their most vulnerable parts. But despite the odds stacked against them, enough fish survive and make it upstream. They've reached the place where their life began, and in doing so, risked everything for a chance to help their species survive. Humans are just another animal trying to survive. And to do so, we must live in balance with our ecosystem. 
Nature is not fragile like we seem to often think. Nature has a lot of resilience. That's the reason why these ecosystems and these species have persisted for millions or hundreds of millions of years. In many cases, we point the finger at nature for being fragile, and that's the reason why we're degrading our, our life support system globally. Let's flip that around and just say, look, give ecosystems a bit of a chance, and they will continue doing what we want them to do, and that's produce goods and services that we rely on, um, produce beauty that we appreciate, and coming to a place like this, you realize how resilient natural ecosystems really are. The life story of sockeye salmon is both heroic and tragic. There are few animals on this planet that go to such extreme measures to produce offspring. And while it's easy to look at them and think, hey, they're just fish, there's something about their sacrifice that hits close to home. Their will to survive, to keep going, even when the odds are stacked overwhelmingly against them, feels incredibly human. And when you compare the animals on this planet to us, you'll realize that we're not all that different and work each day to create a better world for our offspring. Ultimately, the environmental crisis is our species' biggest challenge, and finding the right path forward is overwhelming, exhausting, and really, really scary. But for the future of our children, we must keep swimming. <laughs>